for coming tonight. This is a big night for us. And there's been a lot of work that has gone into getting us to this place in one year. Uh, when, when I took office a year ago, we started looking at the, the state of our buildings. We started looking at our finances. We started looking at our academic programs, our athletic programs. And we knew that we were going to have to make some changes. We were going to have to do some things differently than we had been doing because of just the structure of the way our buildings were built and when they were built. For example, I said this uh, at, at the last meeting to several people. If you were on the valley side today and you wiped out the, high, the schools, the elementary schools on the valley side, and you just imagined that they were not there and we rebuilt those, you would not build a school at Fairfax and then go two miles down the road and build one at Langdale or less, and then go a mile and a half up the road and build one at Shaman, and then two miles up the road and build another one at Hughley. Not with the population that we have. You just That would not be what you did. However, we're functioning with those buildings because of when they were built and why they were built. They were built back when the textile mills were here, and they were built for the mill communities and around those communities. So that's just an example of of one thing that we started looking at when we were looking at the structure of how the school system functions and works. And one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is, and we've worked with our task force, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, is that a lot of people don't understand how the schools are funded and how we get funding and where that funding comes from and how that works with our, our teacher units and how we put teachers in certain buildings. Everybody just thinks that every teacher is funded through the state, and they're not. We have a lot of units in our system that are not funded in the state. They're funded locally. We have to find funds for those. I have people ask me all the time, they say, why does this school have a counselor half a day and they leave and go to another school half a day? It's because of the enrollment at that building. So what we've done is we've created a task force. I wanted a group of like-minded people from across the county, from different groups, different ages, different backgrounds, both from the Valley side and from the Lafette side, from the northern part of the county and the southern part of the county, to come together and look at data, look at information, and for us to make decisions using information, not using emotion, but strictly by looking at data and information, and let that drive the decision-making process, because that's really what we need to be doing when we're, when we're talking about things like if, if I... I have five members of my family. If I lived in a 12-bedroom home, that would not be very efficient. I would have to heat it and cool it and clean it and keep it up and keep the air up and the roof. That's what we're doing at some of our other buildings. And so we have to look at a lot of different things. So what we did was we created this task force, we got them together, and we gave them information. We didn't start with options. That's one of the things we said. They thought they were going to come and just start looking at what, what are some things we could do and change. We didn't get into options till after the third meeting because we wanted them to look at information and data. And that's what's driven this. And so we hired consultants, we've hired experts, we've hired HPM and Tracy Richter, you're gonna hear from him in a little bit. He has been with the county for a while. We've also hired CBG with uh, Lindsey McAdory. They've come from Birmingham to help us. And we've hired Unite. So we're hiring these experts to come in, and one of the things I want you to take away from this is that we are going to be as transparent with you and give you every piece of information that you want. And that's what we did with our, our task force group. If they wanted it, we gave it to them. I went to the CSFO. If they said, how much does this, I went and got it, and we printed it and gave it to them. This is, the, this is our book. This is the book. This is the last section of the book that we've given them of all the things that are in there that we've gone over and the information that they've been given over the last month and a half, two months. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of data to go over. But we wanted them to have that information because you need information to make good decisions. We need good information. And I didn't want you all to think or anyone in the county to think that we were making decisions on our own at the Board of Education without other people's input. That was why we created the group. The group came in. The group wanted to help make changes. They wanted to look at things to do. And so we started looking at the information, and that's kind of where we went. And 
the, we've been led by, the, uh, by our experts, we've been led by the data, and so tonight you're going to get a chance to talk, and that's what you need to do. It's not that we've got to always agree, because we're not always going to agree, but we can have conversation, we can talk about things, because at the end of the day, what's the most important is our kids' education and all the children of Chambers County, that they all get what they need. I told a group in the back a little bit ago that my son's in the 10th grade at Valley High. First period, he has guitar. Kids at Lafette don't get to have guitar. And that's not right. It's just not fair that all kids in the county don't have the same offerings for things. But we're gonna, you're going to see today, and we're going to go over some things, but that's what's driving this conversation. And I want you to know that that's how we're making our decisions. It's tough. It's hard. Because when you start talking about communities and you start talking about schools, closing schools or consolidating schools or building new ones, it's tough on people. And we know that. We want you to know that we understand it. We're not trying to make that hard, but we've got to make some decisions and make some moves that are good for our kids so that we can improve the educational quality and the programs that all of our kids can have. So that's the purpose. So tonight, you're going to have a chance, intimately, intimate settings at these individual tables. We're not going to do this like a church setting where everybody just talks. You're going to have an opportunity to sit with task force members. They're going to introduce themselves in just a little bit. HBM's going to talk. Lindsay's going to talk. And then we're going to let you spend the rest of the afternoon or the rest of the night going through these options and talking to the group members that have been working for two months and become experts on these items. And so that's what we want you to do. And so we're going to, act. so now I'm going to go ahead and bring Tracy up. You're going to bring Lindsay up first. So uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Lindsay McAdory from CBG Strategies. He came from uh, Birmingham to help us. And one of the things we wanted to make sure that we did was I wanted to surround myself with people that could help us sell this message, whatever it is, whatever we decide to do, We've got to be able to do this and make it and sell it and make it look and make everything the best that we can. CBG has been known in our, in our uh, state to do this. They've, uh, you can look them up online. They've had a lot to do in, in Montgomery with the Montgomery tax. When, in 2000, when the Montgomery uh, Board of Education had to try to find a tax to build schools, they were instrumental in helping them do that. That's one of the reasons that we hired them. When we started looking for folks that can help us do things, they were the ones that we looked for. So, Lindsay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me fine without the microphone? Thank you. I, uh, my voice sounds very well across the microphone. Uh, my name is Lindsay McAdory. I'm a, the chief strategist at CBG Strategies based in Birmingham, Alabama. My entire firm is committed to talking to people just like you, getting your thoughts, emotions, opinions on how you want to see the future of your school system in your community. I'm very thankful to Superintendent uh, Chamberlain and the task force uh, for allowing us to be part of this great process. A lot of times, uh, counties, businesses, governments, whomever they be, they call us in on the back end. So usually they've tried to initiate some program or, or some initiative and maybe then go exactly how they wanted to and then they call us in like, please help us. Well, what I love about uh, this community and this county is that they called us on the front end. Uh, they, they're very intentional about engaging the community and hearing your thoughts. Uh, I want to start with like, just a couple of straw poll questions. How many people in the room believe that Chambers County needs to improve their curriculum and the physical structures uh, that they own? How many people believe that to be a fact? All right. How many people believe that uh, by saving money, being more efficient, we can put those dollars back into curriculum and build uh, better programs for our students here. How many people think that that's a fact? Great, great, great. And uh, lastly, how many people feel like the people in this room and across the county should be the people to give the input and to make the final decision on what happens to your, your own children? Who, who thinks that's a fact? I'm very happy to see that. Those were like no-brainer questions, but essentially that's why we're here tonight. We're here to develop a plan pick a plan, uh, give feedback on something that's going to make our community stronger, more vibrant, more attractive, and most importantly, give our kids the best advantage that they can have when they go out to college, the workforce, or the military. Um, 
where are our task force members? That, if, if you would, can you stand and just introduce yourself quickly so they kind of know who to pull on to ask questions? We can start on this side and just go around if you all don't mind. She's also on the task force, and uh, a couple of others that were not able to make it tonight, one being uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul Meadows, he's on there for us, he used to be a board member for us, he's on the task force. Um, a couple of those could not make it tonight, but I, I hope Ms. Spence is able to, to come. She has been instrumental in this, and if those of you that have worked with Ms. Spence and known her from Five Points, um, and how good she is. <clears throat> well, uh, again, thank you to those task force members. Uh, thank you to the community for allowing us to come in and do our work. Um, the only thing I ask tonight, an open mind and an honest mouth. Uh, we want your feedback. Uh, there will be a place for you to leave open-ended comments on the survey. Uh, so to the extent possible, give us everything that you can, that you can give us so that we can uh, make the best plans uh, on, on your behalf. Uh, at this time, I welcome Tracy up to lead us through the presentation, and uh, he'll take it from here. Thank you all again. Thank you, Lizzie. It's, it's really an honor to work with groups like Unity and, and CBG because the message is so important, and to say it the right way and the right terms is really important, too. What I'm going to take you through tonight is a process that is intended to be inclusive and transparent as much as we try and as much as we can. You can see that... The way we go through a process is try to be as inclusionary as possible when we can be. Now, the other piece of this is that what we're trying to accomplish is decision making. Is that when you look back kind of on the history of what is trying to be accomplished here, I think people get to the implementation before they get to a decision. Is that trying to figure out what I'm going to do here before I even made the decision to do something. And until we make a decision, that there's no implementation. I know there's people worried about time zones and location of new high schools and mascots and colors and all that, but no decision's been made. I don't know why a discussion, how a discussion can occur until we make a decision moving forward, whatever that decision will be, because part of this process should be, first of all, make the decision with the community. Second of all, all those implementation things that you need to think about have to be inclusive of the community. 
talking to the community, getting their input and feedback about what is the right way to implement whatever plan moves forward. I will tell you that when I came into this process, one of the things that most concerned me is that you don't have a facilities plan in front of you. You're going to see some stuff tonight that demands, and you're going to continue to hear me say this, that demands a facilities plan. Not for any other reason than some of the data that you're going to see. That without a facilities plan, there's going to be dollars and programs in the future squandered. And we've got to get through that to make sure. However, what got us here is kind of the history of trying to get to unitary status. Now, here's the thing. Every task force member will tell you, I will tell you that this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be a requirement. This should be just the way it is. We should be unified in what we do. Now, it is a requirement to do what we got to do, following good practices, listening to the, the input from the Legal Defense Fund and, and the NAACP and from the Department of Justice. Those are valuable inputs to what we have to do here. And they're critical to decision making. The community is very critical in the decision we make. And so to get to unitary status means that a school district has abandoned the du dual status of intentional segregation practices, working toward, work, working toward a unitary school system. In other words, a district has eliminated the, the vestiges of prior segregation. How do you get those out of your way? And what are the right decisions to get you there? And eventually, although it does not mean that as a, as a factual matter, all district schools contain a racially diverse mix of students, you have to try to get to the percentages. The way counties and cities and, and places are laid out sometimes just doesn't allow it to happen. And so you use good practices to make sure that you make those goals. The history is long, 57 years. Now I feel like I'm not young anymore as I pass that half century mark. And it's outlived all of us. And at some point, decisions will be made. And there's just no question decisions will be made. Now, is the answer to keep pushing it down the road? Well, if you're satisfied with the delivery model of every program you have, yeah, kick it down the road. But if you want to see change and you want to see, then there has to be a good facilities plan in place that reaches some of these goals. The green factors in here are important. The idea of how to achieve unitary status require a lot of different, a lot of different things to occur. One thing is to get student assignment to that plus or 15 minus points within the district profile, if you can, or working toward it, having plans to work toward it. Making sure your faculty and staff and how you hire are the best practices that show that you've gotten rid of those other practices that have happened in the past. Making sure that transportation is equitable. And transportation is a difficult one. We're going to show you some stats on it tonight. It's a difficult thing to tackle in a county this big and with, with, with a, a, frankly, a sparse population for a total county you have a huge amount of mileage you have to cover, and that's a challenge in itself, regardless of if you're even in a plan. The extracurricular activities have to be equal. Physical, the physical facilities, which is what we're going to deal with here, and then the resource allocation is making sure that resources are spread equally among the school district. And I'm going to tell you that's going to be a challenge, and that continues to be a challenge. And you're going to see why with some of the statistics that you see tonight. This is something that every school district in the country deals with. Every school district, I don't care if you're private, parochial, public, but you have to deal with this right here. And we call it a decision made, a, a decision model of looking at wanting good, robust programs for your kids. The best programs that you can have to prepare them for whatever they want to do. And the diversity of programs to offer a wide variety of programs. But people also want low operating costs. Nobody wants to raise taxes. Nobody wants to ask for more money. And then people want the right size schools, typically smaller schools for their kids, to make it more recognizable, to make it more personal. But I'm going to tell you, when you find yourself in this triangle of trying to have low operating cost and small schools, you can't do it and have robust programs because that costs a lot of money with small schools. When you try to have diverse and robust programs at small school size, it's going to cost you a lot. When you have low operating costs and diverse and robust programs, you can't have small schools. That is a triangle that is difficult to get out of. And so the idea is that you can't get out of the triangle, so how do you balance the triangle? And that's what makes every district unique in itself. How do you get the best programs for your schools and the most programs you can get for your kids? How do you get the right size schools that fit your district? Not anybody else's, your district. That fit your size, that fit your personality. And how do you get it at a cost that's reasonable? An investment into what you have to do. 
And that's going to be a tough balance. And I'm going to tell you, that's not for this guy standing up in front of you giving you data. That's your decision to make about how you want your district to look in this triangle. But ultimately, that's the decision matrix. It's not about time zone, and it's not about site, and it's not about anything else. It's about getting your programs to this. And that's a facilities plan, and that's how you get to a facilities plan. Your historical enrollment has shown decline, no question. And there's a lot of factors to that. It's not just, it's not just school system. Birth rates are down in the last 10 years. Housing rates have stayed steady here. Um, the job market's getting better, and so you see some stabilization of enrollment. But we're trying to track all the population to kind of see what it's looking like across the county all the time. You know, what's your, what's your total population compared to your school enrollment? And how does that work in, in conjunction with each other? As you look across the county, where is population growing? Where is it declining? You know, where are we seeing that happening too? Because, again, this factors into what schools will look like in the future. Folks, your district doesn't look the same as it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. And it's going to be no shock that in 20 years this district is going to look different. Because they all do. My high school that I walked out of that I love, dear, doesn't, isn't the same school that I graduated from. It's just not. It has moved to adapt to the population it has, to the programs it needs, to the people it serves. And that's how our schools will continue to work in time. And they'll continue to change with our community. And you can see that change happening. You're going to see this sheet tonight, so we don't have to really focus on it, but this sheet really indicates a couple of things. First of all, it gives the overall kind of status of the population of the school buildings. And it talks about capacity. What I want you to get out of this sheet is this. At the elementary grade level, you are using your elementary schools 51% of its total capacity. That means half of your elementary schools theoretically sit empty. That means keep half of them open, never put a kid in it, but cool it, heat it, Mow it, clean it, roof it, maintenance it, and staff it. And, but never put a kid in it. Half of your elementary schools. That's the utilization rate. At the middle schools, it's 48%. At the high schools, it's a little better at 60%. That number needs to be closer to 80% to have a really good, efficient building. But when I see these kind of numbers, it doesn't, regardless of what you're trying to move to, this demands a plan, that your dollars are being spent to occupy 50% of buildings that you have today. And so what are the plans, or what are some strategies to get around that, and that's what we look at. When we look at a square footage for the district, if you were to kind of go back to Mr. Chambly's idea, of if you were just kind of wipe out the district and start from scratch, and if you put really good programs in at the right square footage, it would say that you need 300,000 less square feet today than you need that you have today. 300,000 square feet. If you look at that, that's two Valley High Schools that you have extra in just square footage. And that gives you extra room for enrollment, and it gives you growth opportunity at the square footage that we've just kind of put a placeholder in for. But if even I just think that maintenance cost at, at $5 a square foot on 300000 is $1.5 million a year, what would you do with $1.5 million? I mean, there, when we're starting to talk about those that are, the, the, the dollars going to facilities instead of programs, and instead of students, instead of aftercare, aftercare programs, instead of special ed, career tech, all those investments, they go to this. As I look at the cost per student, and this is where we talk about allocation, is where we talk about making sure that students have equal opportunity in schools means that you have to distribute dollars differently. Now, this, isn't a, this is not a slide to put judgment on how much we're spending by student by school. What this tells you is that we have to take resources when schools are unequal in size, dramatically different in size, and we have to spread those resources then. Counselors, teachers, instructors, leadership have to be in cars driving from school to school instead of being at school teaching. I can't put a dollar on that. I don't know what that number is. But when, you're, when your dollars are spread like this, what you see is that what's happening is it's, it's the essence of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Is that you're taking away from somewhere to give to somewhere else because you want to try to equal your programs across the board. And so as I look at this number, I'd say, why don't you flip it to another school? If that school had twice as much as your school, what would you say to that? 
And so we have to balance this somehow. It'll never be perfect. It can't be. But without balance of, of school size and programs, you'll never get this number to equality. It can't happen because you have to spread those resources thin. If I look at the operational cost of a school, so just a fact, kind of a quick fact, that 85%, most districts are in this range, about 85% of dollars spent in a school district are on personnel. That's just paying people, 85% of the budget. That means you got about 15% to deal with, and where you can make some economies of scale. So if I didn't staff the schools, if I took the principals out, the teachers, the maintenance, the, the food service, and I took the, the, the custodial crews out, this is what it would cost to operate your buildings on an annual basis. And so it does cost a lot just to operate your buildings. Okay, you think about your home. You know, the more square footage you have, the more you're going to spend on cooling bills, on heating bills, on all those things and maintenance that you have to do. And that's the same with these buildings. They all come with a cost. And I will tell you that every building has a life. And then when investment can't go back into a building, it will lose its life. It doesn't have a choice. Buildings fall apart. They're made by man. They will fall apart. So we need something, we need ways to invest into our schools that aren't being spent on 50% empty buildings. So how do you get to that? When, so I look at transportation. I know this is a big concern for people. But the first thing we have to know are the facts of transportation. So right now, and this is, this is pretty standard, your district transports 47% of kids. We don't transport every kid. No district does. Never has. We offer transportation to every kid within a reasonable distance, people that can walk to school, but, um, but we offer to those who are eligible for transportation. The fact of the matter is, is that at the middle school, this is you see this everywhere, that's the highest percentage of ridership, and we all know because nobody wants to ride with a middle schooler anymore, and middle schoolers don't want to be seen with parents anymore. So we get the highest ridership from kids in the middle school. That's what happens. Elementary school, we still got a lot of parents. I'm that parent. I loved when I was home. To, when I'm home, I take my girl to elementary school because I love to do it. We still do a lot of that. It's convenient. It's on our way to work. It feels safer sometimes. And then the high school, you see the number drops dramatically about the percentage of students we even transport. And so as we start to look at those numbers and we say, okay, 47% of our kids are impacted by this, and of that, 35% of high schoolers, 60% and 44%, it actually puts into perspective kind of the magnitude of transportation that we have. And when I can have the tools, and this is just one example, when I have the tools to be able to say, wherever a building would go in time, how long would it take to get kids to school? And if the longest ridership is in the dark red, how do I minimize that to be less? And the fact of the matter is, 51 to 55 percent, or 55 minutes of travel time on a bus. There are seven kids in the entire district. These aren't, these aren't riders. These are total enrollment that live almost an hour on a bus ride. And so when and if decisions get made, this has to be redone. Because there's no way to calculate if we don't know what a plan's in place for. But the last thing we want is to put a kid on a bus for an hour. Nobody wants that. And any plan that shows that is a plan that's not thought through. But there's no way to kind of calculate this until we know where your buildings will stand in time. But what you also have to know is that when you have 12 buildings in the district, you're delivering to 12 different spots. When you have eight buildings, it's eight spots. There's significant cost difference in eight building to 12 building in transportation. There's better ways to do your transportation where kids aren't riding on a bus, and it seems unfair to them because they live further away from schools. And that's, those are the things you have to solve in a good facilities plan like this. And so when it gets back to it, once again, working toward what you have to work toward is really about this. It's really about what size of schools do you want that make sense for your kids, that give you the best programs that you can have at the cost that Chambers County citizens can afford. Now, again, one of the reasons that I come in, and, and again, I, I do this with a lot of districts, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy conversation to have, and I don't have to pretend it is. It's not easy to stand in front of you and talk about these numbers like this. It's hard. School businesses, schools in the school, school districts are in the business of doing schools. And when you talk about closing schools, that's bad business. And that's the truth. 
But the fact of the matter is, is if you keep paying 50% more than the buildings that you occupy, something will happen anyway. Because the dollars just won't be there to get to where you need to get to. Now, there's different pathways to get there, certainly. And again, part of this opportunity is to have a discussion around it, is to look at the available options that you have in front of you to start a decision-making process, not an implementation process, because there's nothing to implement. There's not been a plan in place for 57 years. We need a plan that sets a decision to then do some implementation so you can have a real discussion around where a building should be, what the name of a school should be, what the time zone should look like. You can really have those discussions if you have a decision. Right now, they're just arguments in the community. And so let's, uh, part of this tonight is, is to try to get to where we need to get to. So what you're going to see tonight are a series of options. Okay, and this is just an example of one. Okay, we've got four elementary options in front of you. Now, one of the things that the task force talked about is uh, that you can come to any high school decision you can, but you can't come to a good high school decision without figuring out your foundation without figuring out what you have to do at the elementary grade level to make sure high school is successful. My basketball and football coaches in this crowd will tell you that you don't build the successful programs by starting it in high school. Y'all are going to all get this. So these are going to be go to your tables. So you're going to, if you can't see it right now, it's okay. You're going to get this. This is the elementary option. The secondary option, you're going to get a copy of this to get and look and take with you. You'll better have this as well as you're also going to get that sheet that shows this one that gives the information the data here you're going to get this and these are the slides that we're going through so if you couldn't read those you couldn't see them you're going to get it it's right in front of you it's right in front of you you're going to get it you're going to take it with you so you'll be able to see all the schools all the school sizes the capacities all of those you'll be able to see everything you want to see along with those plans and you're going to have those discussions at your table so as you go through and i'm going to cover them just really quick for you just give you a brief overview of the intent of the option. So let's start at the elementary grade level. The idea of consolidation of Lanier and BHS into Eugley and Fairfax. Redrawing the boundaries in that area to balance enrollment to meet unitary status. And balance utilization. Make sure the buildings are used to their capacity they need to be used at. Um, consolidate East Side and Five Points to Lafayette, the current high school, into a pre-K-8 district-wide STEAM magnet program. STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. A building to be fully renovated to meet those needs. Every student in the district has availability regardless of that they don't have to qualify for it, they just have to have the desire to go there. Transportation provided into a, in a renovated school for a STEAM program district-wide for pre-K to 8. Which means that you, have, you close East Side Five Points, BHS, and Lanier with the potential operational savings of that of over $700,000 a year. That's not getting rid of a teacher. That's not getting rid of a coach. That's not getting rid of anybody. That's just the building cost alone. The idea behind a consolidation plan is not to fire teachers or to get rid of teachers or administrators. It's actually to reallocate them to give them more support. You still need that many teachers to teach the kids you got. You just need to put them together better. So this idea is just a 700,000 is just buildings. That gets into better utilized buildings and certainly better program offerings. So the second option is around, again, take that, take that um, Lanier and BHS consolidation into a pre-K, a pre-K 235 model that currently exists on the Valley side. And then again, the consolidation of East side of five points and, 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 and it will be Powell. You're gonna see JP here in, here in a minute. Um, into a pre-K-8 district-wide STEAM program. Again, the closing of that, or the possible operational cost avoidance of that is $705. You'll wonder why I say cost avoidance. Is that you're not going to save $705 because that dollar is going to be reinvested into something else, not a facility. So my cost avoidance is paying for buildings that I don't necessarily need for capacity anymore. So option C is to, now this is a big one kind of, and this one kind of is way out there, but I think the task force really thought through this and they thought, let's put everything on the table that we can, is to consolidate all the Valley Elementary Schools, close them all, build one school when you can, okay, it's going to take time to get there, to afford a building like that, that for 1,500 capacity and build it within a school, within a school concept. 
build it so they're smaller quadrants on the building so they don't act like a big school, but there's four different offerings at the school programmatically. Make it on a site that makes sense, that doesn't crowd traffic, do those kind of things. Um, but gets everybody together on, on the Valley side, including getting everybody together on the Lafayette side in a pre-K district-wide STEAM program. The idea is to offer a magnet program, a thematic school that attracts kids from all over the district for just wanting to do it. No qualifications. To go into that school, to a, a full renovated school to do that. Again, in this one, you see the consolidation here of the closure of the, that many buildings is a $1.3 million building savings. And then finally, the last one, which actually goes into an option for the high schools to relate to it, is this idea of consolidating Lanier um, and BHS into Hughley and Fairfax, that whole idea of redraw, right, redrawing those boundaries, but then consolidating five points into East Side, and then um, making, which would then make East Side an elementary steam, keeping Lafayette High School as a 612 building. So 6 through 12. That's going to be a high school option you see. That one relates to that. Because as you get an elementary option, you have to fit it in with your high school options also, or your secondary options. Your secondary options really fall into two categories. The idea of the A and C, the overall difference in these would be the consolidation of high schools. A would be consolidate first and then work to build a school. To build a school that you guys decide where it will be when it will be, how it will be, and how you're going to pay for it. Option C, I'm going to jump over B a second. Option C actually says build the school first and then consolidate it. But that's everybody coming to the altar and saying $60 million. How do you do it? How do you get $60 million in this community to build that high school? Because that's your goal, is to, build, or is to get that to one high school that has one identity for the entire county. Option B goes back to that last elementary option that says you convert Lafayette High School to a 612 building and then you close Powell in five points and you move Powell over to Lafayette and five points into east side. And your steam stops at the elementary grade level. But again, the idea is a district-wide steam. Give kids a choice to go somewhere. Don't force kids to go somewhere. Give them a choice. And so the idea on all these options is that education stays in all community in some way, shape, or form. You, you notice on here I didn't show you cost savings for closing down a valley or Lafayette. There's no plan in here that closes down those buildings in time. Even when you can build a new high school, and I hope you can build a new high school someday. Even when you do that, valley could be a good use for a middle school someday. And it should be. It's got all the things there for a good middle school. And so we don't show any sort of option that says you're getting rid of one of your high schools in the, in the essence of the facility. Because again, that's a facilities plan. So as you go through these, the idea when we come to these types of meetings is not to vote on an option. Because that doesn't do anybody good, any good. Because if more people show up on the Valley side or the Lafayette side, then most votes win. Well, that's not the way this works. It's not everybody comes to these meetings. The idea is to try to figure out where the benefits and challenges or the pros and cons of these things lie. That the plan may not be in these options, or they may be, and most likely, are a combination of these options. And so what, what the task is, is to sit with you and have a conversation around what's good about A and what's bad about A. And what's good about B and what's bad about B. And what's good about C and what's bad about C. And as we go through that and we can disseminate all those challenges and we can address those challenges head on, then you can get to implementation. And then we can pull out all the good and make the best option we can. Ultimately, that's what you want to do. You want the options that give you the best pathways for all kids around, all around the county. And so you will have, and we're going to put at your table also a QR code. And it's also on the, going to be on the district website. We're going to leave open an individual survey that's going to be open until the end of next week. And it's going to ask you to look, at these, to look at these options also. And it's also going to give you a comment section. And it's not a Twitter account, so you don't get just, well, I don't even know what the count is, 72 words? I don't know what it is. But you can write as much as you want. And the idea behind that is that, you know, not every board member is here. Are, are there any board members? I don't know if there's, there's, there's probably some board members. But not every board member can hear every conversation you're having. But what they can do is they can read every comment you make. You can put a legacy of comment 
and input that is permanently written down to read and live in legacy. And that's the point of that individual survey, is for you to go out and really tell us why you think one option works and one doesn't. But tonight, how we want to do these tables is that I want you to look at each option on its own merit. I want you to look at A, right here, and even in elementary schools. And I want you to consider just that option, the bad and the good. I want you to do the same with B. I want you to do the same with C. What you're going to go down, and you will, you're going to go down some conversations of implementation. You're going to say, well, what about the time zone? Well, what about it? You live in two time zones. You find different pathways to deal with a time zone. And you work with the community to figure out what that is. What's the name of the new high school? You don't even have a new high school. That's implementation. And, you, and transportation, kind of the same thing. The idea is how do you get to a decision here? And what are the obstacles in the way of getting in the way of a decision? And if you think this is the way to operate a district, you can say that too. Because that's how you feel, and that's an honest opinion. But I'm afraid that if we, if we don't listen to everybody's voice, and we just listen to just particular voices, we won't hear the entire community here. And that's what we need to do. And so you're going to have task force members at your table. You're going to have me walking around, Mr. Shanley walking around. You're going to have, we're all going to walk around. you got questions. We're going to answer your questions one-on-one. -on -one because we think that's the respect you deserve. And so when you're in your group discussion, if you have a question, raise your hand. Pull on our coattails. Run us over. Do something. Look, if you're angry about something, tell us you're angry about something. If you like something, tell us you like something. But that's the only way we get there, in good discourse of conversation. And we're going to get there. So hopefully what we've done tonight is shown you the data that's important. On the back of this sheet that you're going to see tonight, again, once again, is this exact same PowerPoint. Nothing hidden, it's all there in front of you. You take it home, you go over it. The only thing it doesn't have is a cover page. That's theirs for you to decide. Don't, if you don't want to answer, don't answer your individual questionnaire now if you don't want to. Go think about it. Think about your group discussion after you leave. Then go ahead and answer that, or you can answer it here. Doesn't, ma doesn't matter to us. And then on the other side is that data, and actually the triangle so you can see the triangle, and then you have the option sheets. So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys now and as we go into this discussion, raise your hand if you have questions, and we'll just, well, there's not going to be a closing, okay? We're not going to close with anything. So when your table's done or your discussion's done, um, we just bid you farewell tonight and be safe going home. Um, and if you have questions or comments, please see us when you're walking out the door. Let's try to make sure that we've got a task force member at your group or somebody from the district level. I know we've got a couple of people that are different ones. Let's make sure that, that we have that there. Also, I want everybody to understand these options have been being worked over and worked through for over a month and a half. We didn't start with four and three. We started with about nine elementary or ten elementary options and about eight secondary options. Over a month and a half, they've been whittled down.